It has stood the test of time. God's Book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Thanks for joining me today. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is It Is Written. Every now and then, someone appears on the world stage that makes a dramatic difference. As the old saying puts it, cometh the hour, cometh the man. The hour we're talking about today was the 18th century, a time when England had degenerated religiously into a tired and formulaic routine. The Church of England was now the state church in the United Kingdom. And though it had broken from Rome and several of Rome's doctrines had been rejected, the forms of Rome had been largely retained by the Church of England. And the monarchy had simply taken the place of the Pope as the head of the church. The road to Protestantism had been rocky. Men and women had won freedom from Rome at a great cost. Many lost their lives being murdered or martyred. And persecution was intense. By the 1700s, Protestantism in England wasn't the vital force it's found as it hoped it would be. The vitality had just seeped right out of the church. Formalism and nominalism had taken over spiritual life. Something was needed. Someone was needed. And in the early 1700s, June 28, 1703, the 15th of Samuel and Susanna Wesley's children was born here in Epworth in Lincolnshire, England. Epworth's about 45 miles south of York and about the same distance from Leeds. And today it has a population of less than 4,000 people, obviously much smaller back then. The Wesleys had moved here in 1695. Yet from this unassuming place came the man who would go on to become one of the great religious reformers of all time. He would become the founder of the Methodist Church and would breathe new life into Christianity in England and provide inspiration to Christians all over the world. Only 10 of Samuel and Susanna Wesley's 19 children survived. And if you think that was a large family, Susanna's father, a dissenter pastor who had separated from the established church had 25 children, and Susanna was the 25th. Samuel Wesley, who went to school with Daniel Defoe, the author of Robinson Crusoe, had graduated from Oxford and was the Church of England pastor here. And this is where the Wesleys lived. At that time, the rectory was a wooden building and it had a thatched roof. When John Wesley was five years old, the rectory burned down. His father would say that he believed the fire was set intentionally by discontented church members. Little Jackie, as John's mother called him, was rescued in dramatic circumstances. John wrote later that he was saved as a brand plucked from the burning. This new rectory was completed in 1709 at a cost of 184 pounds not quite $300. When John Wesley was 13, certain events led people to believe that this rectory was haunted. People urged Samuel Wesley to take his family away from here and get them to safety. Samuel said that he believed the devil should flee from him, not the other way around. Samuel Wesley, John's father, was the pastor of this church. This is St. Andrew's Church, the parish church of Epworth. Parts of this building date back to the 12th century. And as a young man, John Wesley was the curate of the parish church in the little village of Root, about five or six miles from Epworth. He's buried here, just yards from where he used to preach. 
John Wesley would come back to Epworth and come here to St. Andrews and step up on top of his father's tombstone and use it as a pulpit from which he would preach the Word of God. When he'd come back to Epworth, visit his family, John Wesley would normally stay right here at the Red Lion Inn. And because he wasn't allowed to preach in the churches, he preached in unorthodox places, such as from right on top of his father's tomb. And he would preach here from these very steps in this exact place. And from these steps, take his Bible in his hand, proclaim the Word of God, and encourage the people of Epworth to follow Jesus Christ by faith. Every Word is a one-minute Bible-based daily devotional presented by Pastor John Bradshaw and designed especially for busy people like you. Look for Every Word on selected networks or watch it online every day on our website, itiswritten.com. There's a great verse in the book of Nehemiah. It's one of the great verses, really, full of meaning. Nehemiah has returned to Jerusalem and he set about the task of re-establishing Jerusalem society. He's in the midst of building the wall around the city. Critics and detractors and enemies are trying to distract him from that work when he sent a message to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Now let's think. Each of us are engaged in a great work, the work of sharing Jesus or that of living for him. The devil wants to distract us, to get us off base, to get us to spend our energies in other areas. And here's God's message about that. It's a great work, a great work we're doing, and nothing should be allowed to distract us from that work. I'm John Bradshaw for It Is Written. Let's live today by every word. John Wesley studied at Christ Church at Oxford University. It was and still is a very prestigious school. King Edward VII was educated here. William Penn, founder of the state of Pennsylvania also, and the current Archbishop of Canterbury. In fact, Christ Church has produced as many Prime Ministers of Great Britain, 13, as the other 45 Oxford colleges combined. And it was while he was here that John Wesley began to experience personal spiritual revival. Along with his brother Charles and others such as George Whitefield or Whitfield, depending on your pronunciation, John Wesley formed the Holy Club, a group of people that met regularly and were determined to live a holy life dedicated to God in a very systematic way. Wesley sought to be holy. So he adopted a very rigid approach to life, often denying himself and following certain methods of living that he believed would enable him to live that life that he wanted to live. This methodical approach to faith in God saw Wesley and his fellows in the Holy Club here at Lincoln College become branded as Methodists. To begin with, this term Methodist was intended as an insult but Wesley and his friends came to embrace the term as they believe it reflected God's will for their lives. When Wesley came to Oxford University, he knew full well just what faithfulness to the Word of God could cost. He knew that in 1536, another former Oxford student, William Tyndale, had been burned at the stake for his faith in Jesus Christ and for daring to disobey the orders of the Roman Catholic Church. And Wesley had another very graphic reminder of what faithfulness cost. You see, right here behind me is the very spot on which Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley, and Thomas Cranmer were burned at the stake for their faith in the Word of God. Latimer and Ridley in 1555, and Cranmer, who had been the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1556, it is said that Latimer said to Ridley as they were about to be burned, be of good comfort. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England 
as I trust shall never be put out. Now, Cranmer, on the other hand, recanted his opposition to the Roman Catholic Church several times, but then he recanted his recantation. He was brought to this spot on Broad Street in Oxford and burned at the stake. And when he was, he did what he said he would do. He took the very hand that had written the recantations and thrust it into the flames. Today, a cross commemorates the spot at which these men gave their lives for their faith in Christ. While near this spot stands the Oxford Martyrs Memorial in remembrance of Latimer, Ridley and Cranmer. The inscription on the base of the memorial says this, to the glory of God and in grateful commemoration of his servants, Thomas Cranmer, Nicholas Ridby, Hugh Latimer, prelates of the Church of England, who near this spot yielded their bodies to be burned, bearing witness to the sacred truths which they had affirmed and maintained against the errors of the Church of Rome, and rejoicing that to them it was given not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. John Wesley knew that the road to reform would not be easy. He understood what opposition to truth could look like, but he was determined. He was determined to live a life of faith, a life to the glory of God, a life that would result in personal transformation. But just as the road to reform in the church would not be easy, Wesley discovered that the road to reform in his own personal life would not be easy either. You see, like most people, John Wesley had to learn the secret of living a life of faith. So what was it that John Wesley learned that changed his life? And could it change your life? More in just a moment. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The uttermost part of the earth seems like an appropriate way to describe Mongolia, sandwiched between China and Siberia. About two and a half percent of Mongolians are Christians. Or to put it another way, Mongolia is 97.5% non-Christian. The church hasn't made real inroads here. And according to the Bible, somehow or other, Mongolians will all be given an opportunity to know Jesus. It is written Mission Mongolia is bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to the people of Mongolia. Your support of Mission Mongolia will make it possible for It Is Written to send teams of missionaries to Mongolia to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bibles are needed in the Mongolian language, and your help will make it possible for people to own their very own Bible for the first time and learn of Jesus. Other humanitarian needs will also be met, as Mission Mongolia provides for many people who are being left behind by a society relentlessly rushing forward. Don't leave Mongolians in the dark. Your help will make it possible for Mission Mongolia to introduce people to Jesus. Call now, 800-253-3000. That's 800-253-3000 to support Mission Mongolia. Or visit us online at www.itiswritten.com. Or you can support this work or learn more about it by writing to It Is Written, P.O. Box 6, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37401. It was in 1735 that John Wesley and his brother Charles, newly ordained to the ministry, left England bound for the province of Georgia in the American colonies. They left from Gravesend, near where the River Thames run to, runs into the English Channel, on a ship called the Simmons. And it was on that journey that John Wesley came face to face with what he perceived to be his own great spiritual lack. While crossing the Atlantic Ocean, a terrible storm arose. Wesley believed that he was going to die, and he was terrified. But also aboard the ship were a number of German Moravian believers. 
members of a religious group that had its origins in the teachings of John Huss, who himself was strongly influenced by another English reformer, John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation. During the storm, the Moravians remained calm, no panic, and they had a peace that Wesley didn't possess. In fact, they sang as the storm raged around them. Wesley later asked them if they'd been afraid to die. No, they said, we were not afraid to die. And it was then that Wesley realized that in spite of his methodical approach to his religious life, he was missing something tremendously important. His brother Charles had a similar experience. It was thought at one time that Charles was going to die, he had become so ill. And somebody asked him upon which he rested his hope of salvation. Charles answered by saying, I have used my best endeavors to serve God. Led to believe that his answer might have been lacking just a little bit, Charles thought, are not my best endeavors a sufficient ground of hope? I have nothing else to trust to. The Wesleys had thought that living a virtuous life and observing all the right forms would bring them to the place where they had peace with God. But they came to understand that genuine Christian living involves an inward change that affects the thoughts and the feelings, not just the words and the actions. They came to understand that this inward transformation was an integral part of genuine Christian living. Up until now, they'd been trying to achieve righteousness by works, but now they began to understand that great foundational teaching of Christianity, righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. In 1738, John Wesley, now 35, and his brother Charles, 31, returned to England. And it was that year that something remarkable happened, something that would change the world. On May the 24th of 1738, John attended a Moravian meeting in London, right here on Aldersgate Street. This is what he would later write about what happened that night. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while the leader was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that He had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. John Wesley would never be the same again, and nor would the world. He continued to live his methodical, self-denying life, but now as the result of his faith in God, and not as the ground of his faith. Wesley came to understand that the grace of God is the foundation of a believer's existence, and he realized that grace resulted in obedience. Wesley dedicated his life to preaching these great truths, justification through faith in the blood of Jesus, and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. World history has taught us to associate the word surrender with thoughts of defeat, shame, and loss. But what if it were the road to ultimate victory? What if surrender meant letting go of your sin or your dysfunction in exchange for freedom and integrity? What if your conqueror offered you healing, wholeness, and power? When you're used to being in charge, surrender to God may be a struggle, but I guarantee you surrender to God is the greatest victory you'll ever win. If you'd like to understand more, request our free booklet, The War Is Over. Simply call 800-253-3000 and ask for your free copy of The War Is Over. If the line's busy, please try again. Or you can write to It Is Written at P.O. Box 6, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37401. We'll mail a free copy to your address in North America. It Is Written is a faith-based ministry and your support makes it possible for us to share God's good news with the world. Your tax-deductible gift can be sent to the address on your screen or through our website at itiswritten.com. Thank you for your continued prayerful support. 
Again, you can call toll-free 800-253-3000 or visit our website, itiswritten.com. Like many reformers, John Wesley had no intention of starting a new denomination when he founded Methodism. It's interesting. Catholicism had been the state religion and it needed serious reformation. Out of that milieu came the Church of England, which itself came to the place where it needed to be reformed. To begin with, John Wesley wanted to teach and preach within the confines of the Church of England, but it wasn't long and he wasn't welcome in the Church of England. He was ardently opposed to the Calvinist teaching of predestination, believing instead that people were free to choose whether they wanted to accept or reject salvation. This pitted him against his good friend, George Whitfield, with Wesley saying that he believed Calvinism represented God to be worse than the devil. After Whitfield died, John Wesley wrote that in some things, people might agree to disagree. That's the first time we know of that the phrase agree to disagree ever appeared in print. And John Wesley was a committed abolitionist. He was friends with William Wilberforce and with John Newton, who wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace. So this was another point where he differed from his friend, George Whitfield, who had argued in favor of slavery. John Wesley usually traveled on horseback and he preached two or three times a day. Stephen Tompkins wrote that Wesley traveled more than 250,000 miles. He gave away 30,000 pounds and preached more than 40,000 sermons. Now, all this travel was not especially good for Wesley's marriage. When he was 48 years old, he married Mary, a 40-year-old widow. Wesley's philosophy was pretty simple. He wrote, I cannot see how a Methodist preacher can answer it to God to preach one sermon or travel one day less in a married than in a single state. Mary had a hard time seeing it that way. She grew weary of his relentless travel schedule and she became jealous of the attention that Wesley was getting from other women. Now, it cannot be said that John Wesley handled all this pressure on his marriage like a saint. He actually wrote and said some pretty scathing things to Mary. Biographer Robert Southey wrote, there are few stomachs which could bear to have humility administered in such doses. Mary actually left Wesley several times, but after he would beg her to return, she'd come back. But things were not good at home. Writer John Pollock wrote, that Mary was actually seen dragging Wesley across the floor by his hair. No wonder then that after 15 years of marriage, Mary left. And when she did, Wesley wrote, I did not forsake her. I did not dismiss her. I will not recall her. Wesley's chapel here on City Road in London was built in 1778. Wesley preached in this very chapel, continuing to proclaim the powerful grace of God that is able to forgive sins and change a human heart. Wesley taught a lot about the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which he believed was the privilege of a believer to receive. He taught on the doctrine of sanctification, how a person could have the mind which was in Christ, enabling us to walk as he walked, as Wesley said. He taught that a person is restored not only to the favor, but likewise to the image of God. Wesley died in 1791, almost 87 years old. His emphasis on personal revival based on the power of the Bible and the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life saw him leave behind 135,000 Methodist church members and over 500 itinerant Methodist preachers. And he died poor. Virtually everything he owned or had earned, he had given to the cause of God. When he was dying, he took hold of the hands of those with him in his room and said again and again, farewell, farewell. And finally he said, the best of all is, God is with us. And he said it again, the best of all, God is with us. And then, he died. He's buried here, just behind his chapel. His godly mother, Susanna, is buried just across the street in Bunhill Field Cemetery, as is John Bunyan. 
The writer of one of the most magnificent and famous literary works in the history of Christianity, Pilgrim's Progress. His brother Charles is buried about two miles from here. Charles is famous for writing some of Christianity's best loved hymns, hymns such as, And Can It Be? Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, Christ the Lord is risen today, and soldiers of Christ arise. What an active place this is gonna be on the morning of the resurrection, when the dead in Christ shall rise. Like so many of us, John Wesley had a religion that was all about the forms of religion, but didn't have the power of living faith. His belief system didn't change his heart or give him assurance of salvation. But everything changed because John Wesley met Jesus, the real Jesus, a personal savior and a close friend. John Wesley discovered the power of the presence of Christ in his life. I want you to know that the same Jesus that changed John Wesley's life can change your life today. The same Bible that brought such power into John Wesley's daily existence can bring power to where you are right now. And the same Holy Spirit that brought transformation and assurance of forgiveness of sins and the life of Jesus lived out in John Wesley's life can bring all those things into your life right now. Just one man, John Wesley, and the world was changed. Just one man, Jesus, and your life can be changed today. Let me pray with you. Our Father in heaven, from this really rather sacred spot, I want to thank you today for Jesus, the Jesus that John Wesley met, the Jesus who changed his heart and changed his life, and the Jesus who can come into our lives right now and make them everything they ought to be. I thank you today for assurance. I thank you that you forgive us for our sins. And I thank you that Jesus will live his life in us and make us completely new. Let us live now believing and knowing and leaning on you and trusting in Christ for our salvation. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for joining me today. And until next time, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.